But first, new to Seven is a dramatization of Steph Penny's award-winning debut novel of love, mystery, and murder, *The Tenderness of Wolves*. In 1860s Canada, a woman journeys through the frozen wilderness to track down her missing son and save him from the gallows. It is a Thursday morning in mid-November. I walk down the road from our house in a dreadful temper, planning my lecture. The road, really just a series of ruts worn by hooves and wheels, follows the river where it plunges down into shallow falls. Leaves frozen by last night's frost crackle under my feet. The sky is an achingly clear blue, and I walk quickly in my anger, head high. Mr. Jamie. Despite being our nearest neighbour, Laurent Jamie's life is a mystery to us. I wonder how he hunts wolves with his bad leg. People say he baits deer meat with strychnine and follows the trail to the resulting corpse. And there are other unusual things about him: long trips away from home, visits from dark, taciturn strangers, and brief displays of startling generosity. He's from Quebec. He is, I dare say, handsome, but not married. Well, some men are happier on their own, especially if they're slovenly and irregular in their habits. Mr. Jamie. He is perhaps forty years old. Sorry to disturb you, but uh, is my son? Forty is as old as he will ever get. Of Wolves, by Steph Penny, dramatized by Chris Dolan. You've just come from there. I found him. I went directly to you. I've run from Jamie's cabin to the house of the magistrate, Mr. Knox. He tried to smile when he saw me. I told him I wasn't dropping by socially. That there had been a terrible accident. We live in Dove River, on the north shore of Ontario's Georgian Bay. My husband and I emigrated from the Highlands of Scotland a dozen years ago. A million and a half of us were driven out. The land swallowed us up, and was hungry for more. You must be exhausted, Mrs. Ross. Go home and rest. No. No, I'll be able to tell you if anything has been disturbed since I left. Very well. Back then, there was nothing here but trees. My first reaction on seeing the place was to burst into tears. Angus waited for my hysteria to pass, and over time, I got used to and even learned to like the silence, the thinness of the air. Now there's one hundred of us, Scots, Yankees. And until today, Laurent Jamie. My God, scalped! But why? Jamie has nothing worth stealing. But no white man could do something so barbaric. It's an Indian outlaw for sure. The stove's still warm. I'll contact the company. Well, they'll, they'll know what to do. They'll send men to help me. It's a distressing sight, Mrs. Ross, but. By tomorrow evening, it will all have been solved. Not long after we arrived here, Angus, my husband, took a trip east. We hadn't spent a night apart in four years, and I looked forward keenly to his return. I ran to meet him, and then realised there were two people in the cart. As I came closer, I saw seated beside Angus a child, about five years old, a girl. Angus told me the French nuns had her, that her parents had died of plague. She was the right age. Her own infant daughter had died the year before. Angus carried this new child in, sleeping, exhausted from her journey, and suggested that we could call her Olivia too. But then she opened her eyes and said, "My name is Frances," in a strong Irish brogue. "Are you going to be my mamma?" We took her inside, and I made the finest dinner I could muster. 
Her dark blue eyes flickered from one of us to the other. Oh, perhaps she was afraid. I picked her up and carried her upstairs. I remember how her hot, limp body made me tremble with feeling. Angus. I heard all about it. You found Jamie. You all right? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. Is he back? The magistrate's organising an investigation. Hudson Bay Company men. They'll arrive tomorrow. Well, I expect they'll come here. What are we all coming to? Well, Jamie was a foreigner. They're hot-blooded, these Frenchies. I have to go back out after. Well then, eat. The first morning that little Frances was with us, I took her hand and led her downstairs to a hot tub. She lifted her arms for me to peel off the long petticoat. I felt angry at first, stupid. Angus had brought home a boy. I'll be home soon. Mr. Knox? Magistrate of Caulfield and Dove River. Thank you for coming so quickly. Donald Moody. At your service. Are you... Do you have a commanding officer? I'm afraid he's in Sault Ste. Marie. They've sent me. I've made arrangements for your men at Scott's Lodgings, just down the road. You're welcome to stay here in our house with us. It's more comfortable. You will be with us a few days. I imagine so. Perhaps Jacob should take a look at the victim straight away. Jacob? Our Indian guide and tracker. Have you, uh, investigated a murder before, Mr Moody? Donald. No, Mr Knox. This is my first. Francis never seemed surprised that he had come to us dressed as a girl. What did the nuns think, that they would find a home more easily for a girl than a boy? Francis gave no explanation or expressed any shame. Nor did he offer resistance when I made him trousers and cut his long hair. He thinks we never forgave him. I did. But Angus is a Highlander through and through. He doesn't like to be made a fool of. I don't think he ever got over the shock. Now Francis is 17 and gone without a word. I'm praying for things not to be there when they irrefutably are. Tinderbox. Sleeping blanket. Oh. Fishing rod. The only things missing are a set of clothes and his knife. Oh, where are you? Donald Moody, from the Hudson Bay Company. Deputy for the factor of Fort Edgar. Yeah. Is your husband in? Ah, oh, he went to town on business. He should be home soon. But may I? Oh, oh, of course. I believe you found the body, Mrs Ross. I did. Oh, please, uh, sit down. And you have a son, I'm told. Francis. He's off at present on a fishing trip. Left yesterday morning. Early? Oh, very. He usually stays away a few days. Your husband and son both knew Mr Jamie? Of course. He's our neighbour. Francis and he were friendly. Francis usually goes up to Swallow Lake. 
So he'll move on if the fish aren't biting. You look anxious, Papa. Don't worry. If all this will be over soon. I hope so, Maria. How long will the men be in town? As long as it takes them to question everyone, I suppose. They mean to wait until Francis Ross comes back. But he'll be all right, won't he? I'm sure he will. It's just... It brings back memories. I know. That must be our guest back. Mr. Moody. What's his first name? Uh, Donald, I think. Rather young to have such responsibility. I shall go and be the attentive hostess. You must be father's detective. Donald Moody. I'm no detective, I'm afraid, Miss... Uh... Maria, I hope your room in our little house is adequate. More than adequate, thank you. Tell me, do you really think you will find who killed Laurent Jamais? Someone must have seen something in a place like this. We won't let you live in fear. Oh, <laughs> I'm not afraid. We've lived through tragedy before. I was very little when Mama's sister... Well, that's another story. Nightcap, Donald? Hmm. I trust your men have settled. It seems so. They enjoy being out of the fort. Sludge. I've inquired around town. A trader by the name of Gros Andre passed through Dove River a couple of days back. And a peddler called Daniel Swan. Francis Ross was seen going into Jamais's cabin. Exactly when is confused, but within the last day or two. Which doesn't mean that he's guilty of anything. Well, the mother says he's been off fishing. I get the impression around town that he's something of a strange character. The boy keeps himself to himself. Do you intend to follow this Andre fellow? He might know something. My colleague, McKinley. He has more experience of these things. He'll follow the trader. Jacob and myself could track down the Ross boy. Well, you only have the mother's word on his whereabouts. Jacob can find anyone, Mr. Knox. He should be back from his fishing soon. Perhaps you're right. I'll wait and question him when he returns. If he doesn't, a day or two will make no difference to Jacob. Angus. Sometimes I wonder if Angus would not grieve too much if her son never came back. These days they look at each other with such venom, like sworn enemies. It's normal, isn't it? For boys his age to take off for days on end. You always say so. Oh, Angus. Francis has gone. A man, a friend of his, perhaps the only real friend he had, is dead. Oh, of course, there can be no connection. do something. The third day since Laurent Jamais' murder. Three days since our son Francis disappeared without a word. Angus seems unperturbed by the situation. But then I too have done nothing, which convinces me I'm utterly without talent, courage or use. I am anxious for Francis, but my concern is overwhelmed by my inability to take a decision about what to do. Angus, you have to go after him. He's fishing. It's only been a few days. 
Once, I only had to snap my fingers and men, Angus included, came running. I've tried to be a better person and now my own husband refuses to meet my eyes. He didn't take his rods. Or his blankets. He could be cold. I had an accident. Maybe it's simply that as a woman grows older, she loses the ability to charm and persuade. He's not a child anymore. I'll go up to Swallow Lake. Oh, I'll come with you. And don't be silly. I'm sure he's fine, Rue. I'll be back soon. Rue. He doesn't look at me, but the old endearment causes a tremor, nevertheless. So, Mr. Moody, you're just guarding our safety while the others pursue the suspects. Miss Maria, I... I'm waiting for Francis Ross. If he doesn't return today, I'll go after him. Tell me, you don't really think that Francis Ross could have murdered Jamie? What do you think? Well, I think he's a 17-year-old boy. A rather good-looking one. But shy. He doesn't have many friends. He gives the impression that... that there are things going on under the surface. How do you mean? Well, there was once. I, I remember at school... He was about 14, and, and another boy was annoying him. I, I can't remember how, but, but suddenly Francis went into the most frightful rage. He, he went paper white and started hitting the boy as if he wanted to kill him. In a sort of frenzy. Yep. But the attack on Jamais wasn't frenzied, Mr. Moody, was it? The man was scalped. Carefully, according to my father... A procedure that would take some attention. True, but... We can't rule anything out, Maria. Jamie's cabin looks exactly as it did. Except, thank heavens, the body's been removed. There are boxes and crates stacked everywhere. One contains his Sunday clothes. A pressed silk flower faded. A love token? I'm looking for something that will confirm my son has nothing to do with this. I stick my hand into bins of grain and flour, and that's when I find it. A slip of torn paper with numbers and letters. 61HBKW. Well, why hide a piece of paper in a flour bin if it only has nonsensical letters on it? I put it in my pocket. Your men off on the trail of the trader. Only two of them. The rest will remain here for the meantime. Angus Ross was seen heading north, presumably in search of his son. If he brings him home, I'll question the boy. If not, Jacob and I will go after him. Your Indian tracker. Laurent Jamais was scalped, Donald. I can't believe a white man, not even a French trader, is capable of such a thing. Isn't any man capable, if he feels he has reason enough? And what does Jacob make of the rumours around town about Indians? No Indians have been sighted these past few days, Mr Knox. If an Indian doesn't want to be seen, Mr Moody, he won't be. Coming away from Jamie's cabin... My mind fixes on my old problem. When I was young, I was troubled by what were termed difficulties, seized with paralysing fears that rendered me incapable of movement, even speech. Doctors assured my parents that whatever it was, it would disappear with the onset of adulthood, by which I think they meant marriage. Before this theory could be tested, my mother died in unclear circumstances. I believe she took her own life. My father insisted she accidentally took too much laudanum. I was increasingly plagued by fears. 
so much so that my father placed me in an asylum. Then he too died. And there laudanum was freely available. It took the place of parents and friends. I could go to the store and buy some now. Angus is away looking for Francis. In the last few days, I've thought almost as much about laudanum as I have about my missing son. The only thing that stops me is I am the only person in the world Francis can rely on for help. And so far I'm not being any help at all. Then I see a sled dog and another dog up by Jamie's cabin. There's a man there going inside. The man turns and I see his face. He's looking around but he doesn't see me hiding by the hillside. He's tall for an Indian. Strong. In blue capote and skin trousers. He gives a powerful impression of wildness and cruelty. I watch him go inside. I've never seen anyone quite so ugly in all my life. Miss Maria, you play beautifully. <laughs> Thank you, Donald, but hardly. <laughs> I'm not cut out for such pursuits. <laughs> so, tomorrow you could be setting off into the bush. It looks that way. Francis must know the woods like the back of his hand. <laughs> I admit it's a new experience for me, but my tracker will find him easily. Then I suppose we won't see you again. I'll come back. Soon, I hope. You know, you know what would be wonderful? Is if you would write to me. Let me know how things are here. <laughs> you mean, like a report? Exactly. <laughs> Although... I'd also like to know how things are with you. And I could write back, if that's agreeable. Is it possible to correspond between Dove River and the bush? We could try. Donald! Mr Knox! <clears throat> then we shall. Mrs Ross reported him snooping round Jamais. What was she doing there? She lives close by. Perhaps she was passing? He was still there when your men went up. We put him in Mr Scott's storeroom. It's the only place with a lock on the door. Did you get anything out of him? Very little. His name is William Parker. He claims he didn't know Jamais was dead. Just called on him in passing and found the cabin empty. And these are his dogs? Yes. Why would a man go snooping through an empty house? Well, that isn't a crime. Not even unusual, unfortunately. As magistrate, I'm not sure we have any grounds for holding him. Mr Parker, we would like another word. How did you come by the name Parker? My grandfather was English. A Hudson Bay Company man? Yes, my father too. Worked all his life for the company. But you don't? Or for the North America Company? I trap furs and sell them, that's all. You have no furs at present. It's fall. You understand why we have to ask these questions, Mr. Parker? Jamais died a brutal death. We have to find out what we can. He was my friend. Where were you on the day and night of November 14? Travelling out from Sydney House area. Did anyone see you? I travel alone. You came through the bush? I was hunting. You said it wasn't the season for furs. Hunting for meat. I used to think, when I was a girl, and even later when I was in the asylum, that when people married, they never felt alone again. I assumed I was destined to be a spinster. Oh, I had friends in the asylum. 
even in Dr. Campbell, a special kind of friend. But it was my husband who made me feel legitimate. Here was someone I did not have to hide anything from. I suppose what I mean is, I loved him, and he loved me. You didn't find him? No. Yes, I loved him, and Angus loved me. I'm just not sure when that stopped being true. Parker could have been in Dove River that night. Who would have known? Even so, it's not proof, Donald. Would you rather believe the Ross boy did it? What's this North America company you asked him about? I've never heard of it. It's not an official company, yet. But it might become one. French-Canadian traders planning to set up in opposition to us. Jamais was French? An enemy of the Hudson Bay Company? No company man would have done that. There was no sign at all. Traces of two people, clear as day. But no one had fished there. Went straight through. If it was Francis, he was running. And you came back. It was Angus who decided that my laudanum habit was a barrier to intimacy. He took my supply and threw it away. He was the only person who thought this was a trouble worth taking, yet when our son is in need, he turns his back and he walks away. Then I'll go after him, before the snow comes. Oh, I don't know if I want him to argue, beg me not to leave, insist he comes with me. Oh, well, at least he doesn't laugh like most husbands would. The man Knox arrested. He was seen coming from the north. So, uh, well, he might have seen Francis. I'll speak to him. Then I'll go. My mind is made up. I know what I must do. And I am scared to death. Mrs. Ross. Good morning. Mr. Knox. The magistrate can't help himself frowning. I am, after all, the mother of a suspect in Dove River's first murder. I found the victim's scalped body and reported the arrival of a second suspect. I complicate poor Mr. Knox's life. I would like to speak to your prisoner. Parker? I'm afraid that's out of the question. Apart from the problem of judicial process, well, the man could be dangerous. I'm not frightened. I'm told you have him housed here, in Mr Scott's storeroom. <sighs> this way? The fearsome-looking man I saw at Jamie's cabin lies slumped on a pallet and takes no notice when the door is opened. Thank you, Mr. Knox. I'll be fine. But hadn't I better... Oh, thank you, again. <sighs> the prisoner stirs, pulling a thin blanket around him. There's no fire, and the cold seems harsher inside than out. He doesn't look at me, but sits like a statue. I move a crate closer to his pallet and sit down. Mr. Parker? My name is Mrs. Ross. I, I come to you looking for help. Oh, I apologise for taking advantage of your d detainment. He doesn't acknowledge me in any way. Mr. Parker, I believe you came from the north, past Swallow Lake. What is it to you? Uh, I have a son, Francis. Seven days ago, he went away. I think he went north. I'm worried. I wondered whether you'd seen any sign of him. 
He's only 17. Dark hair, slight build. Seven days ago? I could kick myself. I should have said eight or nine. My son did not kill Mr. Jamie. How do you know? B because I'm his mother. And Laurent Jamie was his friend. I was Jamie's friend too. Yet Knox and the company men seem to think I killed him. Uh, I'm sorry. But, uh, I think an innocent man would do his utmost to help a woman in my situation. You mean they'll release me if I help you? Well, that depends on circumstances I know nothing about, Mr. Parker. Such as whether you are guilty or not. I'm not. Are you? Me? Well, I found him. I saw what had been done to him. You saw him? They didn't tell me how he was killed. If he's lying, he's making a very convincing show. He leans forward. I try not to lean away, but his face is terrifying. Tell me what you saw, and I might be able to help you. I can't make a deal with you. Then why should I help you? Well, why would you not? I'm half-breed, Mrs. Ross, accused of killing a white man. They won't believe anything I say. I'm tired. Oh, Mr. Parker, I beg you. He lies on the pallet, pulls the blanket over him, his back to me. Maria. We're going after the Ross boy, before dawn tomorrow, so... I won't see you. You suggested we write. I have less faith in our mail providing a service between Dove River and the bush than you, Donald. A letter? Perhaps keep it until you're on the road. I shall reply as soon as it is possible. That may be some time. I trust your talk was helpful. He told me nothing. But, Mr Knox, he knows something. I have to speak to him again. I can't let you do that, Mrs Ross. You see... No, he didn't do it. What makes you so sure? He wanted to know how Jamie died. He didn't know. But he does know something about Francis. And he doesn't trust... He doesn't trust the company men to be fair on a half-breed. I'm sorry. But they're moving him out of town as soon as possible. Mr. Knox. I take a step towards him, almost as if, were I a man, I meant to threaten him. My son is in the bush. He may be lost, he may be injured. If you stop me from finding out whatever I can, you will be responsible for his death. I thought you, of all people, would understand what it is to lose a child. Come and see me tomorrow. The magistrate is the uncle of the famous Seton girls. On a mild September day 15 years ago, Amy, who was 15, and Eve, 13, set off to gather berries by the banks of the lake. At four, by the time they should have returned, there was no sign of them. Their father, Mr Knox's brother-in-law, set out to trace the girls. A massive search was got up for those Seton girls. But not a shoe, not a scrap of clothing was found. Not even a footprint. It was as though a hole had opened in the ground and swallowed them up. I consider entering Mr Scott's store to buy provisions, should I need to make a journey into the woods. But the company men are by the door, and I'd rather not pass them. I have provisions at home, and I would only be tempted to buy laudanum. Then I see two figures heading out of town. There are only two ways to leave Dove River, south to the bay, or north following the river's course through the forest. One of the men I assume is Donald Moody, the young man placed in charge of these rugged frontiersmen. The other will be his Indian tracker. The latter stops to pick up the traces he's following. My own sons. Then they disappear into the trees. Donald Moody struck me as a civilised man. With him gone, I worry all the more about the colleagues he's left behind. Look, 
twigs broken underfoot. And here. It's been some days, but more than one person came through here. At the same time? Could be. Or one behind the other. Jacob says he's been travelling for six, seven days. He's tired, hungry. And we go faster, Mr. Moody. We'll catch him. How soon? Mr. Parker, I... Good God, man, what's happened? Your turn, Knox. What did they do? The company like to think they can encourage a man to confess. I cannot confess to something I didn't do. You're bleeding. I'll get some. Nothing's broken. This should never have happened. I'll tell you something I didn't tell them. Jamais had enemies. He was a founder of the North America Company. Hudson's Bay men don't like it when one of their own turns against them. We better make ready a shelter. Be dark soon. Jacob, this is the first time I've ever tracked. I know. Apart from a few outings from Fort Edgar, first time I've ever been in the forest. You're doing fine, Mr. Moody. You can light a fire? Of course I can. <laughs> My life's changing, Jacob. Becoming the real McCoy. A true frontiersman. <laughs> <laughs> Write to your girl. Tell her. What girl? <laughs> Miss Knox. Passing flirtation. On both our parts, I imagine. Now that I'm away from Dove River, she gave me a letter. I have to open it on the road. Go on, then. I'll wait for a better moment. My husband can't bring himself to search for a son he doesn't feel is his own. I'm amazed how peacefully he sleeps, while I lie awake, distressed that I must go and look for Francis myself. And I must go now. The snow will be here any moment. But I lack courage. I cling to the hope that Moody finds Francis first and brings him home. I don't care if they arrest him so long as he's all right. Then I won't have to face my fear of the wilderness. Only one person throws a stone at the window. He knows it'll wake me and not his father. I hope this is worth it. You could have stayed with Parker. Send another man with me. <laughs> Got to start tracking sometime. Parker will be taken to the city and questioned. Nothing more I need to do. Two trails split here. One leads straight north. The other, over there, ahead. I think the second man lost the first. Francis Ross's is the second trail? The first one's faster, so yes, the second one must be the boys. Where the hell are they going? Look at this place. No one can live here. <laughs> they call it starvation country. I don't know it well, but there are company posts further north. Perhaps the first man was heading up there. And Francis Ross? I think he's lost. Right here? Good God. Francis! Please, don't scream. <gasps> Who is that? I thought you were... I'm sorry to startle you. Parker! Uh, but how... Knox released me. I'm going to follow your son, because I think he saw the killer. But I need provisions, and my rifle is impounded. Mrs. Ross, I need your help, and you need mine. Oh. Give me a moment. 
So that's how it works. Mutual need makes people cooperate. Nothing to do with kindness. And so, while my husband sleeps upstairs, I prepare to go into the wilderness with a suspected killer. A light snow falls over Dove River, sooner than I'd hoped. Mr Parker has his dogs and sled waiting half a mile behind our house. He arranges our provisions and furs on the sled and makes a sort of seat from the stiffened hide. I am about to express gratitude when he ties my food and blankets on instead. I'm too shocked to care about the impropriety of the situation. If you've already lost what matters most, little things like honour and reputation lose their luster. He ties the dogs to the sled. He doesn't look at me or say a word. I follow him, stumbling. I'm determined not to complain, ever, no matter what. my son came. Mr Parker just nods. He is to say the least a man of few words. Until now I have not had the inclination to ask any questions. I know why I'm on this journey. To find my son before Donald Moody does and prove he's not guilty of murdering Laurent Jamie. But what are Parker's reasons? To clear his name of the same murder? Or has he another motive for making this journey? I've needed all my strength to keep up with his punishing pace. But now the going seems a little easier. Moving through a permanent twilight under the trees. Mr Parker, I asked you before, on, on your way to Laurent Jamais, did you see any sign of my son? These are the same trails we're following now. Trails? <laughs> There's more than one. Two men came this way. Francis was with someone. One man following the other. Oh, how can you tell? One trail is always behind. They make separate fires. If they'd been together, they'd have shared one. Well, how can you follow a trail under the snow? Four men leave a lot of trail, Mrs. Ross. Four? The company men who went after your son. They're easy to follow. Oh. Dear. Killed by Francis Ross, or the other one. Killed and picked clean by animals. But there were people here. And there, a horse. Wait a moment. Mind over matter, Donald. <laughs> Remember what father used to say. Rise above it, as if he'd know. Scottish accountants don't march through bogs for days on end in the Canadian bloody winter. Mr Moody, look, over there. Fog? No, smoke. Looks like a settlement. This isn't my country. I don't know who they are. Who cares? The people, they'll have fires, walls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose a true company adventurer longs so much for home comforts. All people do. Everywhere. Parker stops to make camp, evening turning fast into night. He cuts a stack of pine branches with my husband's axe. Angus will be cursing its loss. Hm, too bad. He should have thought of that before abandoning his son. Parker erects the skeleton of a shelter with boughs in the lee of a large trunk. The sandy coloured dog has taken a shine to me. Strangely enough, she's called Lucy. The smaller boughs Parker arranges on the ground, like the rays of the sun, leaves to the centre. It looks like a place of sacrifice. I thought I'd better quash before it goes any further. 
He covers the hole with tarred canvas sheets. You ever hear him play the fiddle? It takes me a moment to realise he's talking about Laurent Jamy. And then I am outside the murdered man's cabin, by the river at home, hearing that sweet, strange music, and seeing my son burst out of the door, his face transformed by laughter. And I am paralysed by loss. I haven't cried for Francis in days. Too busy lying for him, planning a way to help him. I, I don't know what has changed now, but the tears spill down my cheeks, stroking my face like warm fingers in the cold. Oh, uh, forgive me. My son liked Jamie's music. He used to play when we worked on a gang. Oh, you, you worked with Jamie For the company? A long time ago. Oh, you, don't, you don't seem like a company man. My grandfather was English. Did you know him? No. Like most, he didn't stay. He married my grandmother, who was Cree, but went back to England. They had a child, my father. He worked for the company all his life. And your mother? My mother was supposed to be a good, mission-educated Catholic girl. But she was always a Mohawk first. I smile at him. It's always comforting to know that a suspected murderer still loves his mother. Donald Moody from the Hudson Bay Company. This is Jacob. You're German? Norwegian. You're very welcome in Himmelwanger. It means field of heaven. My name is Per. Thank you, Per. So, what are two Hudson Bay Company men doing here in November? We are following someone. From Dove River, on the bay, up through the plateau. The trail led here. A boy? Yes. Is he here? I found him on the river bank. His leg was broken? How did you know? Someone had fallen into a ditch back there, like you say, by the river, and didn't move until you picked him up on your horse. He was close to death, so we have been caring for him. I'll get you some food. It will warm you. Something extraordinary is happening. As the wind abates, I realise I am enjoying myself. I feel guilty. I should be worrying about Francis. Yet I am happier now than I've been in a long time. In a wilderness I thought I could never even enter. What I always hated about the forest is the never-ending sameness of it. I'm not even afraid now of my taciturn guide. Since he hasn't murdered me yet, despite plenty of opportunity, I have begun to trust him. Not all my fears, however, have evaporated. What about... Wolves. Wolves don't attack people. There was a tragedy in my village years ago. Magistrate Knox's nieces, the Seaton girls, disappeared. I've heard the story, but nothing about them being attacked by wolves. There was no sign either that they were kidnapped. But that's the more common belief, no? If there's one thing worse than being eaten by wolves... It's being captured by Indians. Anyway, wolves don't eat all of a corpse, Mrs. Ross. If wolves had attacked those girls, there would have been traces, splinters of bone. The stomach and intestines would have been left. Oh, you sound like you speak from familiarity with such situations. I've never known wolves to attack without being provoked. We have not been attacked. And wolves have been watching us, following us, ever since we left Dove River. Are you trying to frighten me, Mr. Parker? Thank you. I feel restored already. You are welcome. Now, tell me, why do you follow the boy? There was a serious attack... 
it's not certain that this boy is the guilty party, of course, but his, his mother is extremely anxious and... He left the night of the attack. What has he told you? Not much. He has been very ill. Delirious for a while. But he did say that he was going north to a new job. And then lost his uh, Indian guide. Which you believed? He said he needed the job for money, but... He had quite a lot of money on him, over forty dollars. Forty dollars? But he didn't even go home first. Parker has rigged a smaller piece of canvas from the branch that forms the tent's spine, so there's a sort of curtain dividing the space in half. This is his only gesture towards propriety. There is a beauty in this system, though I blush to think about it. It preserves a sort of privacy, while allowing us to share the heat each of us generates. We worm our way into the tent. I curl up in my blankets inside that little dark tunnel, my heart hammering too scared to move. I hold my breath. Parker turns and shifts and breathes inches away from me. At last he stops moving, but some part of him, I realise with horror, is pressed up against the canvas curtain and therefore against my back. I wait for a fate worse than death. Mrs Ross, are you awake? Yes. If you can, move your head to the opening and look out. There's nothing to fear. Outside, there's a cool greyish light, the unseen moon reflecting off the snow. In front of me, the remnants of our fire. Beyond that, the two dogs standing alert and tense, pointing at something in the trees. With a jolt, I realise there is another dog-like shape grey against the snow. It looks small. It seems to be alone. I watch as it approaches a few feet and then backs off again like a shy child. I have to talk to Francis. Francis? Who is Francis? The boy. His name's Francis Ross. No. This boy's name is Laurent. Laurent? Did he give his last name, not Jamais? The trail leads here. It's unmistakable. An English youth with black hair, though they say he looks French or Spanish. It sounds like him. I need to see him. No, it's late. He's asleep. Père, Laurent Jamais was the victim of the attack. Laurent Jamais was murdered. Murdered? I see. Uh, you've travelled far and the boy is still unwell. I see no disadvantage in waiting until morning. I look over at our dogs, and when I turn back, the wolf has vanished, like a grey ghost. I do not know how long I have been staring out of the tent, but suddenly I realise that Parker is right next to me, watching, too, for another sighting of the wolf. He's so close. I can smell him. Not the smell of dogs or sweat, but something more like foliage. He smells of life. I have a sudden memory of the asylum greenhouse, that sharp, rich smell. And then another memory, Dr Campbell, pressing my face into his shirt. I had not known that a man could smell like that. That was a wolf. I can't stop myself turning a little and inhaling to get a stronger fix on that memory. Tantalising. Not at all unpleasant. I try to do it imperceptibly, but I sense that Parker notices. And you're not afraid? Not anymore. I see the sandy-coloured dog, Lucy, staring, her mouth open and tongue hanging out like she's laughing at me.
For four long days the sky stays wet and low, and I travel through thick trees with a suspected murderer. Only a mother in search of a son, a boy suspected of a murder I know he did not commit, could take on such a foolhardy journey and make me endure such torments. Mr Parker seems confident that we're still on Francis's trail. We travel slowly but distinctly upwards until the forest begins to thin out. And unbelievably, we come to the edge. We are standing on the edge of a vast plain. The cold is like a hand laid with implacable force on the snow, telling it to stay. Oh, so beautiful. It's one massive bog held to cross before it froze. Francis. My name is Donald Moody. You are Francis Ross. This is Jacob. We followed your tracks. You came from Dove River? Did you know a man there called Jamais? Sorry? Jamais. Laurent Jamais. Yes. I knew him. Why did you tell him your name was Laurent? I... I don't know. Why would you want to hide your real identity? I don't know. Do you know that Laurent Jamais is dead? Yes. I saw him. And I saw the man who killed him. Tell us exactly what you saw. He... he just died. The blood was wet. That's how I knew the other man was the killer. This man, do you know him? What did he look like? It was dark. A native. Long hair. Would you recognize him? Maybe. What was he wearing? Trapper's clothes. Why were you going to Jamais's cabin? We were friends. What time was this? Midnight, maybe? Late. He didn't go to bed early. He, he wasn't a farmer. So... You saw the body and followed the man. You didn't go home to pack? There wasn't time. I had to follow him. But I lost him. You think I killed him? Did you? I told you. I saw the killer. The effort is becoming beyond me. This plane is too big. Too empty for humans. We're as vulnerable as ants on a plate. Think of something else, Mrs Ross. Think back. Dr Campbell. A new doctor arriving at a boring Scottish asylum is a major occurrence. Young, handsome, kindly. The female dormitory became suddenly full of sighs. I held back from the idol worship. So, odd that I got a summons to his office. There was a contraption set up in there. Dr Campbell said it was a camera, a box for taking pictures. He wanted to make a photographic study of the inmates. Apparently I had a very suitable face. There's a mental condition known as the Ophelia complex. Dr Campbell felt that an illustration of the love-lorn sufferer would be useful. He put a crown of flowers on my head. And so it began. Oh. Much longer. Oh, please stop, Parker. I, I need to rest. We haven't gone far enough to rest. I don't care. I can't. I can't walk another step. Then we'll have to stay there. Oh. Tell me about the money. What money? The money you took from Jamais' cabin. I thought I might need it. You just took it? Stole it? I didn't steal it. What good would money be following a trail? I thought I might have to pay someone to find the man. In case I needed to stay somewhere. In the middle of the forest? At last Parker stops. I've been driven purely by anger for an hour. He repacks the sled making a space in the middle. Sit there. 
Now I'm as touched as I was angry before. Oh, oh can the dogs manage? We'll manage. I don't understand what he means until he attaches another line to the sled. He places the loop of hide around his forehead and leans into pulling. He tugs and strains until he finds the same metronomic stride as before. Rosie! Cisco! Stop! There's a company trading post that way. But the trail seems to lead this way. But is it Francis's? What's the point in talking to you? You've already decided what happened. Why didn't you tell someone what you saw? Your father, he's a respected man in your village. My father. If you want to solve this so much, why aren't you following the other footprints? The ones the murderer left. You could have followed those tracks just to make sure you got somewhere safely. If I was going to run away, I wouldn't run to this godforsaken hole. I'd go to Toronto. I'd get on a boat. Just get out of my room. Francis! Mum! I run to him. Hold him. It's all I can do. Hold him. We'll leave you together. My son looks so pale and thin. A child's body beneath the sheet. I need to stroke his hair, his face. I can't stop touching him. You came for me. How did you do that? We've been so worried. <laughs> you hate traveling. <laughs> oh. oh, when we get home, we'll start again. Oh, no more closed doors, no more silences. We'll be happy. Is Papa here too? Uh, he couldn't leave the farm. We, we thought it better if just one of us came. He doesn't draw his hand away from mine. But there is a slipping apart somehow. He'll be so happy to see you. He'll be angry. How did you get here? There was a tracker, Mr. Parker. They think I killed Laurent Jamais. It's a mistake. I saw him. I know you couldn't have... You saw him? I found him. I found him. I found him and followed the man who did it. You must tell him everything. Oh, Francis, why didn't you come to us? Well, what if the man had attacked you? Does Papa think I did it? Oh, how can you say such a thing? He smiles. A twisted, unhappy smile. He's too young to smile like that. Mr Parker. I'm surprised to see Mrs. Ross, but the last time I saw you, you were under lock and key. You were found innocent, or The you... magistrate let me go. Knox? He saw your friend's idea of justice. I don't understand. They tried to beat a confession out of me. Idiots. I'm sorry. I... If I'd been there... Knox saw what they'd done. But, but letting you go is... Knox hasn't the authority to do such a thing. This is a company matter. Is it, Mr Moody? A company matter. I go in search of Donald Moody. He's not in his room. I mean to wait outside, but on the desk of the tiny cell, I can't help but notice an envelope addressed to him. A woman's hand. Next to it lie a pen and a sheet of paper. He's written, Dear Maria, at the top. Maria Knox, must be. And then nothing. As if he couldn't think of anything to say to her. Mrs Ross? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to talk to you. I fully understand your concern. As a mother, it's only natural. And it's only natural that you should want to find the perpetrator of this terrible crime. Francis wants to find him too, as he's told Mrs. you. Mrs Ross... I have very pressing reasons for holding your son as a suspect. Which are? For one thing, he fled Dove River with the victim's money, then lied about it. 
but surely it would be negligent not to pursue all possibilities. Uh, the other trail may be the murderers, or it may not. How will you know unless you follow it? <sighs> Further investigation will have to wait until the weather permits it. Back in Dove River, the Hudson Bay company man seemed kind. An unwilling enforcer, now I'm revising my opinion. In Himmelwanger, he has assumed the mantle of authority and wears it gracelessly. It's clear to me that he sees his mission as finding my son guilty of Jamie's murder. I thought it would be moody again. <laughs> Francis, I need to know. Donald Moody accuses you of stealing money. I did. Oh, why? Oh, there's money at home. Francis, why didn't you come back? Tracks don't disappear that quickly. Why were you at Jamie's in the middle of the night? Ro was the only person I could talk to. You know I love you, don't you? And your father loves you too. <laughs> you think so? You can tell us the truth, Francis. Good girl, Lucy. The man Francis followed has to be found. Moody must be made to see my son is innocent. Oh, you were going to do that anyway, weren't you? Continue trailing him. Why? Now that you can look after your son... No. No, I have to go. The trail gets much harder from here. Winter's closing in. Uh, Mr. Parker, I I'm sorry, but there will have to be witnesses. If the man you're following is Jamie's real murderer or knows something about it... Mrs. Ross, even if you did make it, and we have no idea how far this man has gone, if you get there and don't discover what you hope to... I'll take that risk. I have to give my son a chance. Francis will be safe here. Purr and the women will keep him safe. Will you take me? Oh, you know how important this is to me. I've no idea why it's so important to you. Will you take me, Mr. Parker? I have no reason to expect Parker to help me. Looking into his eyes, I see no trace of compassion. I beg you! Mr. Parker and I have been trudging across this barren plain for three days. So has Donald Moody of the Hudson Bay Company. I insisted he come with us. We're on the trail of the man my son insists killed Laurent Jamie. If we discover anything, Moody should be there to see it. The snow turned to rain for a while, making progress very difficult. Now we're ankle deep in mud. My son is still back in Himmelwanger, in the care of Moody's Indian tracker. I am on a mission to prove my son innocent. Moody is on a mission to prove him guilty. What Mr Parker's motives are, I still cannot work out. Lucy! Cisco! Stop! What's that place? Ahead of us is a complex of buildings. Even from here, I can see something's not right. A trading post. Or it was. We should go and look. I hate the bleak structure we're heading towards, so I force my mind back to Dr Campbell. The handsome young Edinburgh doctor who used me as his model for mental afflictions. Once or twice a month, to start with, I was summoned to his office and placed in front of the photographic machine. Paul gathered costumes and props to create his scenarios. For melancholia, which I felt more than qualified to portray, he had me sit by the window, 
in a sombre dress, gazing longingly out as though, as he put it, I was dreaming of my lost love. There are worse troubles in life than an errant suitor, so I dreamed instead of braised venison, curried chicken, trifle with nutmeg. Lunch, when it arrived, was every bit as good as my imagination. Tasting spices after five years of Scottish asylum food was heaven. Elbow Ridge. You know this place. Hmm. Built by a company in competition with yours. Your Hudson's Bay friends burnt it down. Why would they do that? Someone's been here. With a campfire. We could do worse than copy him. Stay here? But what is it? Another two days to Hanover House? I think we should keep going. Look at the sky. It's going to be a storm. Very well. Let's pitch camp. Over the next couple of hours, as the light fades, the wind rises. Are your feet getting worse, Moody? I'll be fine. Come in behind the canvas. Let me look at them. There's no need. Take the offer when you can, Moody. Very well. I'll get a fire going. Perhaps it's the thought of my son that makes me offer. After all, the age difference between Donald and Francis is not very great. Under the half-assembled canvas, I'm not gentle, but he makes no sound as I clean his wounds with rubbing alcohol and bind his feet tightly with strips of linen. Parker seems to be watching us, although in the darkness and the smoke from the fire, I could be mistaken. Why are you holding your side? It's your feet that are bleeding. Here, let me see. It's nothing. An old scar. Oh, it's quite a new scar. And weeping. How did you get it? <laughs> a funny story, actually. When I arrived at Fort Edgar, I thought it might be an idea to organise a rugby football match. Oh. I tried to teach everyone the rules, but when we started playing it... Anyway, I chased a member of the opposite team who was running for our line. Brought him down hard, but clean. When I tried to get up, I realised I was bleeding. My opponent was lying next to me with a knife in his hand. Oh, and a rugby game. Who was this opponent? Uh, the injury didn't seem too bad. <laughs> Heat of the moment. Yeah. Jacob. Oh, the tracker you left with my son. Ever since, Jacob has been the most steady companion. Came to my bedside the next morning to apologise. He'd been drunk. He swore he would give up and he promised to look after me as long as I stayed in the country. And has he? Too much so at times. <laughs> he tried to stop me coming with you on this journey. He said there was danger. <laughs> he saw it in a dream. Perhaps he was right. <sighs> He hasn't touched a drop of alcohol since the rugby game. His dreams aside, Jacob is the first true friend I've found since I left Scotland. I say nothing. Donald Moody, it seems, has a tender heart to be so forgiving with his Indian companion. He strikes me as a young man confused about what he wants. Except when it comes to my son, who he is determined to accuse of murder. Mrs Ross, you must be a tough woman indeed, keeping this pace up without a blister. Mr Parker gave me moccasins. You should acquire some when we get to Hanover House. And when will that be, do you think, Mr Parker? Will this storm blow itself out tonight? Even if it does, the snow will make the going harder. It might be more than two days. You've been there before? A long time ago. You seem to know the route. Do you know the factor? Stuart. Stuart. I once heard a story about a uh, Jamie Stuart, famous for making a long winter journey in terrible conditions. Do you know him, Mr Parker? Or do you prefer to keep us wondering as usual? I met him. 
Well, I worked for the company. Splendid. A reunion. The snow doesn't stop, nor the shrieking wind. By unspoken consensus, the canvas is not rigged into a curtain to give me privacy. So I lie down between two men, rolled in layers of blankets. The snow's deep out there. Deeper it gets, warmer we'll be in here. So, we'll be warm while we're smothered to death. We can dig our way out. I can't help thinking of those poor Seton girls. Seton girls? Oh, don't you know the story? He's new to this country. <sighs> Two girls disappeared from Dove River. They went out one day, what, 15 years ago now, to collect berries. When they hadn't returned by nightfall, a search was got up for them. No trace of them was ever found. I tell Donald Moody the whole story. Or perhaps I need to hear it myself. The worst that could happen to you. Wolves, abducted by Indians. I tell him how their parents searched and searched and died of searching. All these years and still nothing. Actually, you have a direct connection with the family, Mr Moody. Amy and Eve Seaton were nieces of Magistrate Knox. Maria's cousins. Maria never mentioned. We should get some sleep. <sighs> I need to take my mind off the Seaton girls. Remember further back, far from here, Scotland. I was summoned to Dr Campbell's study with increasing frequency. The poses became less formal. I gradually wore less and less, ending up tangled in a diaphanous sheet of muslin. Any pretense at contributing to the forward march of psychiatric science was soon abandoned. Paul was kind and thoughtful. He listened to my opinions. I was happy when he put his hand on mine. A sweet craving. Our thrilling secret behind the locked study door. He was sweet and desperate and apologised every time for taking advantage of me. I never minded. Morning and the storms subsided. But we have to dig our tent out of three feet of snow. Another day comes. More snow. Aching limbs. I think of something nice. He smelt of greenhouses, of tomato leaves and damp earth, sharp and satisfying. What happened, I'll never know. Dr Campbell was disgraced, not through me. It was announced that he had to leave suddenly. One day he was there, the next not. I can still remember his photographs. Dark, silvery shadings on glass that shimmered as he tilted them towards the light. You sure that's the right place? Hanover House. The Hudson Bay Company post is surrounded by a river on three sides. The river flows slowly. It's not quite cold enough for it to freeze yet. It looks deserted. Perhaps it's abandoned. But Parker points towards a man walking around the side of the building. A dark-skinned man with powerful shoulders and long, wild hair. He stops dead and stares back at us. But he just turns and walks away. Are we supposed to follow him? I'm sure someone will be out in a minute. True enough, a few seconds later, another, this time uniformed man, comes out. Good heavens, it's true. You in charge here? Frank Nisbet, assistant fighter. Donald Moody, from Fort Edgar, this... Is Mrs. Ross, and that is Parker. He guided us here. My God, man, you're hobbling. I've been in some discomfort, merely blisters. Well, you'd better come in. Donald! Let's not say anything about why we're here. See how things are first. We're a little short staffed, I'm afraid. We have imposed rather suddenly on you. No imposition at all. Uh, as you must know, the company prides itself on hospitality. Uh, 
You must all join me for dinner. Oh, perhaps Mr. Moody should clean his feet up first. Could be an idea. The rooms might be in a bit of a state. Three rooms, is it? Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Oh, along here. I'll get a firelight. The man is nervous, jumpy. I wonder why. There is something in his restlessness that I recognise. By contrast, Hanover House itself is dark and silent. I can't even hear dogs. Odd for a company post. This place creaks with secrets and I must discover what they are. Later, going along to dinner, there's no sign of either Moody or Parker. Moody will have fallen asleep. Parker, I imagine, will be tending to the dogs. And then I hear voices in a room to my left. Oh, for God's sake! I can't see or hear who Nesbitt is talking to, but there's some urgent argument going on. Without thinking, I move back into the shadows. You'd better not say anything about him if you don't want to feel my hand. In fact, just stay out of the way altogether. Just wait till Stuart comes back. I was right. Hanover House is a house of secrets. I find myself alone with Mr Nesbitt, assistant factor at the remote, run-down company post Hanover House. I would rather that both Donald and Parker were here with me, so we could form a united front on how to approach the question of Francis. I want no mention yet that my son is suspected of murder. Donald, his silent but chief accuser, is exhausted and sleeping. Mr Parker, in keeping with his Indian blood, is presumably outside, despite the snow and cold. I'm sure you could use a warming brandy, Mrs Ross. Thank you, Mr Nesbitt. I've asked for supper. So, who all lives here then? Only two officers. Uh. Mr Stewart, one of the finest men you could hope to meet. <laughs> then there's your humble servant, General Dog's body. <laughs> and a few half breed native families around the place. Miss Knox. Dear Miss Knox. Dear Maria. Don't know why I'm bothering. I am writing to you from Hanover House. Ah, water. Thank you. I'm told you need bandages. Thank you. Is I... it your feet? Let me see. I have a lot of experience. If you're sure. My name's Donald. What's yours? Elizabeth Bird. Slange. So, tell me. Now that we're all settled, what brings you all here? Oh, this is painful to relate. My son ran away from home. Mm. Uh, he was last seen in Himmelwanger. Do you know it? Oh, I don't believe I do. A uh, community of Lutherans. Admirable. <laughs> Elizabeth! You'll have to excuse us. We're a small post. <laughs> From Hemmelwanger, the trail led in this direction. Although after the snowstorm, we couldn't be certain. There aren't many settlements in these parts. No. No, we're quite isolated. Mm. Is he very young, your son? Seventeen. You can understand how worried I am. Mm. The other man wants to sleep. Then leave dinner on the table, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. 
Mr. Stewart's on a hunting trip. Ah. Yeah, he should be back soon. Elizabeth, um, is she the wife of one of your men? That's it. Mm. So, you've not heard of any strangers? Alas, no. Oh. Nesbitt fumbles ceaselessly with a stub of pencil, flicking it back and forth, twirling it round. He's anxious, waiting until something clicks into place, and he stops fidgeting. I know the sign. Laudanum. God knows what brought him all the way up here, far from druggists and doctors. I need to find Parker. Speak to him before I do, or say something inconceivably stupid. I find him in the stables. He's taken the dogs there and has bedded down himself. He's rolled in blankets and sleeps facing the door. Although we've spent many nights under the same canvas, it feels improper somehow to watch him sleep. Mr Parker? Something happened. Uh, I had dinner with Nesbitt. I told him we're looking for my son. He's run away. That's all. I asked if anyone's passed by here recently. He said no, but I think he's lying. He's an addict, I can tell. Laudanum. Wolves. Far away. Better get back. Just thought I should tell you what I've said. We can do nothing until Stuart gets back. What is it you know about him? I won't know till I see him. I'll wait for a moment, but I've run out of reasons to stay. As I stand, my arm brushes against his leg. I leap to my feet as if scalded. Well, uh, good night then. Outside, the aurora shimmers like a beautiful dream. The cold cools my skin, but not my thoughts. I have an intense desire to go back into the stable and lie down in the straw next to him. Lose myself in his scent and his warmth. No. It was a mistake. His body brushing against mine. A mistake. A man has died. Francis needs my help. I'm a married woman. Even if Angus will do nothing to help our son, I'm here for Francis. No other reason. Ah! Good morning, Mrs. Ross. Donald, where's Nesbitt? Well, I don't know. Last night I told him my son has run away. I didn't give a reason. I said nothing about Jamie's murder. We don't want to put them on the guard. My dear lady, I wish you had consulted me before inventing an untruth. Oh, there was no time. Don't see anything else or he'll be suspicious. Mr. Moody, I trust you slept well. How are the feet? Oh, much better. Breakfast. Excellent. <laughs> I think, my dears, that may be Mr. Stewart's returning. In the courtyard, four or five men and women are standing around a man with a sled and a tangle of dogs. More figures appear from different directions. Nesbitt talks clandestinely with a new arrival. Elizabeth, the woman who served us, is staring at the man. Then she sinks down in a heap on the snow. What's going on? Most unfortunate. The Papanis bird has met with an accident. Fatal. Elizabeth's husband. It's Donald Moody who goes to the stricken woman. He puzzles me. The young professional so blindly devoted to duty, yet these moments of softness, compassion. Stuart is of middle age and height, striking blue eyes and a weathered face, close-cut hair turning from fair to grey. The overall impression is modest, attractive, trustworthy, except perhaps for those eyes, piercing, bright yet dreamy. 
Mrs. Ross. Ah. Delighted to meet you. Mr. Stewart. And you must be Donald Moody, Fort Edgar, I believe. It's a beautiful part of the country. I've heard much about you, sir. Mr. Parker, I believe thanks are in order for guiding these people on such a difficult journey. Pleased to meet you again. Again? Sorry, I don't recall. William Parker, Clear Lake, 15 years ago. Clear Lake. Forgive me, my memory isn't what it used to be. Perhaps if you roll up your left sleeve, it will help. (laughs) Oh, my God. How could I have forgotten? William, of course. Oh, well, a long time ago. It's a sorry morning to meet you all. The Papanese bird was one of my best men. What happened? We were hunting in a river not far from here, following some tracks. I, I still can hardly believe it. Nepopanes was an experienced hunter. No one knew more about the bush than he did. But he stepped on a spot of weak ice. One minute he was there, the next he had gone. I crawled out as far as I could. No sign of him. Put my head under the water. Nothing. His poor wife. Elizabeth. Two children. I saw you went to her. It seemed the right thing. Perhaps you thought me callous to leave her alone, but these people believe that no one can say anything at such a time. They have to grieve on their own. But she's not alone. We should... In her private grief, Mr Moody, she is alone, is she not? But life goes on, as do company traditions. You were too tired last night to tour Hanover House. Come. And the storehouse... Stocks are low. Not quite, Mr Moody. We ship out most of our furs over summer, Mrs Ross. Not much to see, I'm afraid. Uh, Now, normally I would take you to meet everyone, but today there's much grieving. Uh, Mr Stewart, you have many things on your mind at the moment, but you know we're here for a reason. Yes, Frank mentioned you're looking for someone. My son. His trail led us here, or near here, at least. You haven't seen any strangers recently? He's 17, black hair. I'm sorry we've had no one here. Until you. Oh, what's this? Uh, a pack marker. 66HBPH. Six, six now, the code refers to the furs, uh-huh. the year to May last, the company, of course, HB Hudson Bay. Uh-huh. Now, this is P District, and finally the post, H for Hanover. The flower bin. At Laurent Jamy's cab in the morning, I found him. I was looking for something, some clue. All I found was a slip of paper, just like this one hidden in his flower bin. I think I still have it with me. The trail we saw. Could it have been one of your men, and not my son's? Not one of ours. Oh. All I can think of is my husband's face, under the ice. May I ask, um, he wasn't a Christian? I am. And the children. The Papa niece was Chippewa. You think praying would help me, Mr. Moody? Are you close enough to anyone to know how this is? I don't know. There is a girl. No, of course not. You have two children? Amy's only two. Amy? Pretty name. This girl. What is her name? Miss Knox. Maria. The snow stopped. Tomorrow I'll go to the river. I'll find him. Bring him home. I can't help thinking about the argument I heard last night. Between Nesbitt and someone else? I don't know who. He said he, or perhaps she, would feel his hand if she didn't keep quiet about him. That's what he said, about him. Who? Then he said... There's someone outside. I can't tell Parker any more about my suspicions. 
or about the pack marker so carefully hidden in Jamie's house. And I can't tell him what I'm convinced of. Somebody here wants us watched. Until this evening, Nesbitt, the assistant factor at Hanover House, has been nervous. He's keeping a secret from us, as we are from him. I've told him nothing of my son's discovery of a murder, or that Donald Moody is convinced that my son himself is the guilty party. But a moment ago, Nesbitt returned from seeing Stuart, the factor, and now his movements are languorous, his eyes sleepy, the edginess gone. Mr. Stewart must dispense Nesbitt's laudanum. Pour me one of those, Frank. I was thinking, Mrs. Ross, about your Mr. Parker. Oh. Can't believe I didn't remember him. How did you meet? Uh, he was in Dove River and we needed a guide. Someone suggested him. So you don't know him well? Uh, not particularly. Why? He is, was a rather colourful character. There were incidents. Oh. William was prone to fighting when he was younger. We went on a journey together, 15 years ago. A hard expedition. Corals blew up, food running low and so on. Anyway, we came to blows. You'll recall he said he had given me something to remember him by? Stuart rolls up his left sleeve. Running down his forearm is a long white scar, a good quarter of an inch wide. It's not his scar that disturbs me, but the memory it evokes of the last time I saw Laurent Jamy, sculpted. And the first time I saw Parker, a terrifying, savage figure searching Jamy's cabin. Sorry. Perhaps I shouldn't have shown you. Oh, it's not your scar that frightened so. It's the thought of Gade, such a handy fellow with a knife. Well, sometimes these half-breeds, you give them a quart of rum, and they turn into a dervish. Oh, uh, Mr Parker has been a model guide. Uh, perhaps, as you say, his violence was the result of rum. He doesn't drink now. I have grown used to Mr Parker. I have seen aspects of him I would not have expected the first time I set eyes on him. Was my initial judgment closer to the mark? He was a half-breed, suspected of the same murder as my son. But I've begun to wonder if he has other reasons for being on this journey. Have you got what you wanted? What do you mean? Why you came. It had nothing to do with Francis. Should it have been? I never knew the boy. Has it even anything to do with Laurent Jamy? Laurent was my friend. What's Jamy got to do with Stuart? Oh, this whole journey? It's about Stuart. It's him you wanted to see again. Because of some stupid fight. Stuart showed you the scar. He says you did it in a fight. On a journey. Not on the journey. After it. Oh, before it, after. What does it matter? Stuart was promising. Everyone said he'd go far. One winter at Clear Lake, he made a group of us go on a journey to another post. Four of us, including a young boy, a child. Three hundred miles. The weather was terrible. You don't travel in winter unless you have to. Stuart did it to prove he could. Was this the famous journey that Donald spoke of? It was famous, but not for the reasons he thinks. There was a blizzard. By luck, we found a cabin hundreds of miles from anywhere. One of those January storms that go on for weeks. We ran low on food. The only thing we had plenty of was liquor. Jamé and I decided to go and get help. Laurent Jamé was there. Stuart and the boy stayed at camp. We were lucky. After two days, we found an Indian village. Then the weather got worse, 
and we couldn't go back for another three days. When we did get back, something had happened. We found Stuart drunk. The boy was dead. Oh. Lying on the floor, suffocated by his own vomit. Stuart mumbled something about going out in a blaze of glory. He decided they'd drink themselves to death. And the scar? He laughed at the dead boy. Oh. I drank then. Oh, to hell with the accounts. Being in my life. You can do them, I hear, Moody. Not at another post, I couldn't. Where's Stuart tonight? Oh, round and about. You know, that man is an absolute saint. Natives love him. Hmm. Admirable. And me, I'm second rate. I may not know much, but I know that. And what about you, Moody? You first or second rate? <coughs> I'm not sure that it's a helpful distinction. Ah, but it's self-evident, if you've the courage to see it. Courage? It could be a way of abdicating life's responsibilities. All failures excused in advance. You think I'm a failure? Not at all, Mr Nesbitt. Five or six years ago, the company was short of men, so they brought over some from Norway. Convicts. I wasn't there, so this is hearsay. These men mutinied and took off, with a lot of valuable furs. Stuart was in trouble, for the mutiny and for losing so much valuable stock. There was a fortune for the man who found them. Dozens of silver fox. Know how much a silver fox is worth? No. More than its weight in gold. Stuart was sent out here as a punishment. What's all this to do with Laurent Jamy? Last year, I found the furs. And the convicts? Didn't find them. But they'd cashed the furs as though they intended to come back. I told Laurent he was going to arrange buyers in the States. But he could never keep his mouth shut when he was drinking. <laughs> Word must have got out, back to Stuart here. That's why he died. You mean Stuart killed Jamie? No, I'm trying to figure it out. If Stuart got his furs back, he'd be a hero in the company again. There's a connection, that's all I'm saying. And remember, the trail from Jamie's cabin led here. <gasps> Wait. I found this. At Jamie's. A pack marker. 61HBKW. Where was this? In the flower bin. You searched Jamie's cabin. What for, Mr. Parker? Some clue, like this. I gave this to him. Can I keep it? If you can think of some use for it. Will you tell Donald all this? Maybe at last he'll see the truth. It's not proof. He likes Stuart. Stuart was always good at making men like him. Besides, if I'm right and Stuart got word that Jamais knew where the furs were, it's not Stuart's way to go to Dove River and kill Laurent. He'd get someone else to do that. Why would anyone kill for someone else? Money? Fear? One of the men here? Ni Papa Nis, Who then threatened to talk. And Stuart killed him. His wife and the others are out looking for the body now. Be interesting to see what they find. Stuart might have found out Jamie knew where the furs are. But he can't be sure who told him. Oh, you... I see them returning in the middle of the night. The menfolk look downcast, not talking. There's no sign of Nipapani's body. Elizabeth, taller than the rest, walks behind. She looks cold, utterly apart from the search party. They've returned, empty-handed. 
According to their beliefs, the Papanese's spirit is trapped in the river. Elizabeth is Christian. She's as white as she is Indian. I don't know if that makes her situation easier or harder. She seems strong. Well, she has to be. For her children. Amy and Alec. Christian names. You must understand her position better than I. Thank you, Donald. Is it worse to lose someone than to have no one in the first place? Do you really have no one? I'm not sure. I wonder what they think, not finding the Papanese. What is there to think? His body was washed down the river. He drowned. Uh, they only have Stuart's word for that. Did you see them? Last night? Without any Papanese bird. Donald saw what we saw, but still believes in Stuart. I didn't sleep. Your theory. Where does any Papanese fit into it? Where is his body? I'm not sure yet. But you have a notion? Oh, and my son. Did Laurent tell Francis about the furs? Where they're hidden? Oh, why did Francis take off that night? Oh, not after the furs. No. You're holding back on me still. I have to know what you know, at least about my son. I don't know what happened with Francis that night. Oh, but you know something. Parker, if my son was involved with Jamie in some way with these furs... Laurent wouldn't have told Francis. He wouldn't have put him in danger. Why not? Because they were friends. And accomplices? You and Jamie were friends too, Parker. Jamie loved your son. A strange way of putting it. What are you seeing? Jamie was... He'd been married. But sometimes he also had friends. Young men. Handsome, like your son. I'm sorry, I... I the last time I saw Laurent alive, he mentioned someone who lived nearby. He knew I didn't judge him. Oh, God! Oh, I should have stayed with him. You're a brave woman. No, I'm a stupid one. Loose strands of hair fall over my eyes. A couple of them are white. I'm getting old, and my head is full of thoughts I can't bear. The thought that I didn't know that that was why Angus hated our son. Somehow he had found out. And I can't bear the thought of Francis's grief. Unbearably lonely. When I saw him, I didn't comfort him nearly enough. It seems the world has changed forever, yet nothing is different. My mind pitches between regrets of the past and worries about the future, but I am all the more convinced of my son's innocence, and I only have the future to make amends. I'm finding tasks for myself in the kitchen. It's amazing what you find in a house of secrets. My activities keep me from worrying about my son. He's lost so much more than I'd realised. To be suspected by Donald Moody of killing the very man he loved must be unbearable. I cannot wait to return to him of anger and take him in my arms. Early this morning... Elizabeth's party returned from searching for her husband. 
there was no sign of Nipapanese bird's body where Stuart said he'd drowned. There's an air of foreboding around Hanover House. I'm waiting for something to happen. For God's sake, Stuart, I keep telling you. As I knew it would. It's gone! It has to be one of them, Nesbitt. And an thing, half-man. You've got to keep better control of him. Morning. Good morning to you, Mr Nesbitt. You're looking for something? Oh, believe me, I know how vexing that can be. What are you talking about? I know Mr Stewart keeps it for you. He makes you beg, doesn't he? What have you done with it? I'll give it back if you tell me something. Who needs to be controlled? Who is this half a man? Oh, him. <laughs> uh, we didn't want Moody to know if it, if it gets back to the company. One of our men's gone mad. Nipapanese. Stuart's trying to protect his family. Nipapanese isn't dead. He lives on his own like a wild man. Well, you, you pretended he'd died. A few weeks ago, he went crazy. Maybe dangerous. Oh. Stuart thought it would be better for Elizabeth if... He's here now. Isn't he? He comes and goes. Can I have it? Please. The bottle I took from Stuart's office early this morning. What would I not give to take a drink of that laudanum? Could the Papanese bird have been Jamie's killer? Parker thinks Stuart got someone to kill Dove River's voyageur. Jamie knew from Parker where the silver fox furs were hidden. Would that be enough for Stuart to have him murdered? I can't imagine Donald Moody preferring that theory over the guilt of my son. Moody is much impressed by Stuart. Elizabeth. Mr Moody. Donald. If there's anything I can do... You asked if, if I was a Christian... Are you? Do you pray? Not as often as I should. I don't have anyone to pray for. You have your children. Family. Amy. Alec. Nice names. Were they... family names? Why? I was just wondering that... If I could pray, I wouldn't ask for my husband to be brought back to life, but for justice. Justice? My husband was killed. What are you saying? We went to the river. My husband was too good a hunter to fall through such thin ice. Stuart killed my husband. Why? Why would he? I don't know. That night in Dove River, when I heard Laurent Jamie play fiddle, and Francis came running out, laughing. Oh, I should have known then. Children grow up. He called Francis his petit ami. Laurent could be hot-headed, but he cared deeply for your son. Tomorrow I'll leave. Well, but it isn't finished yet. It's the only way to finish it. In the morning I'll somehow show Stuart the marker you gave me. Then he'll know for sure I was in with Chame. I'll tell him I'm leaving. If I'm right, he'll follow me to see if I go to the furs. Will you? Yes. But if Stuart has Jamie killed, he'll kill you too. I'll be ready. Oh, it's too dangerous. He'll have this half-man with him. The man Nesbitt says is Nipapanese bird. You have to take someone with you. Donald needs to stay here to see if Stuart follows me. Then he'll know the truth. I'll come with you. You need a witness to corroborate what you say. I don't know what proof you think Stuart will provide other than by killing you. What if he sends someone else to kill you? 
If we can't connect Jamie's murder with Stuart, my son will still be under suspicion. If you don't take me, Parker, I will follow your trail. As well as the excellent Mr Stuart, I've met another extraordinary person. An Elizabeth Bird. She reminds me of you. Her features bear a resemblance. And now I find I can picture you perfectly. Your gentle eyes. It's nearly dawn, Maria, and I feel as if you are here with me. Believe me, I thought about it a great deal. Can't I offer you some coffee before we start the day's questioning, Mrs. Ross? William? Very well. I decided that telling Elizabeth that Nipapanese was dead would bring her and the children less pain. And now you call him half-man. Nesbitt told you that? Mm. Yes, in case we mention him in front of Elizabeth. I see now the plan was foolhardy. I apologise again for deceiving you. My intentions were good. Stuart's eyes are haunted. Parker takes his pipe out of his pocket and, as he does so, a scrap of paper falls onto the floor near to Stuart. Stuart picks it up and hands the pack marker back to Parker. The whole incident takes perhaps three seconds and the two men's eyes never meet. I don't know where half-man Nipapanese is, but I'll arrange a, a search, if you like. I'm going to get ready. Give me five minutes. Mrs. Bird, I am sorry to ask you this, but was your husband ill? <laughs> Nipapanese was as strong as a horse. When was the last time you saw him? Uh, nine days ago. Or was he here in November? November, yes. And the man they refer to as Half Man, have you ever seen him? No, though I've heard his name for many weeks. Then they are two different people. Elizabeth, you have helped me greatly. Stuart is lying. Parker and I are going to find justice. Remember, Donald. Watch and see if he follows. Mr. Stuart isn't interested in chasing after furs. You're very loyal, Mr. Moody. It's not just loyalty. You're taking Mrs. Ross with you. No one is taking me, Mr. Moody. I'm going of my own accord. If you aren't interested in clearing my son's name, I am. Lucy! Cisco! Pull! You were interested in my children's names, Mr. Moody. Why? It's just. Uh, please don't think me impertinent, but. The most amazing thought keeps coming to me. Have you ever heard of the Seaton family? Two girls who disappeared from Dove River. Amy and Eve. They were never found. Elizabeth, would you once a Seaton? I won't tell anyone if you don't want me to. My name is Elizabeth Bird. What made you think of the Seatons? You've heard of them. The story was in my mind. I, I told you there was a girl, Maria Knox. She's a cousin to Amy and Eve. You resemble her a little. What does your Maria say about this disappearance? That it broke the parents' hearts. That they never got over it. Are they both dead now? But Aunt Alice is still alive. Donald, tell me about them. They live in Dove River. Mr. Knox is the magistrate there. Do you remember them? Of course. I was 13 years old, not, not a baby. Maria would have been about two. 
they're all well. They've been kind to me. I suppose you'll tell them about me. Only if you wish it. I have to think of my children. What about your sister, Eve? I'm Eve, Mr. Moody. Amy's my sister. We got lost. We were scared of Indians. It got dark. Then we gave up and fell asleep. And then she wasn't there anymore. I thought she'd found her way home and left me in the forest because she was angry with me. No one came to find me. Until my papa niece came. Your parents loved you. They never stopped looking for either of you. Nipapanis used to talk about a sickness. The sickness of long thinking. Oh, you should know. Stuart is, is planning a trip with this half man. Hunting, he says. But, but the men say they're following your friends. I have to follow them. I have to see where they go. Oh, they're dangerous. You mustn't. I have to. They... I... I need proof. Now, then take Alec with you. Your son? I couldn't. He's too young. What if something happens? I, I couldn't take responsibility. He's 14. He's a man. Now that Stuart has killed his father. Tell him to get ready. I want to be close on Stuart's heels. Donald, will you go back to her? To Maria? Will I? She's... Maria has been very much on my mind. Yes, yes. I think I will. Tell her about me. As soon as I get home. Something strange has happened to the weather. It's nearly Christmas, and yet though we walk across frozen snow... The sky is as brilliant as a sunny day in July. The dogs are delighted to be in the go again. Things seem simple. My eyes burn with the brightness of it. But as the sun goes down, I discover what my stupidity has led to. try not to think of where we're headed, the middle of the wilderness where precious furs have been hidden. Parker's hoping Mr Stewart will follow us. I hope Stewart turns up for the sake of my son, to prove that Stewart, not he, is guilty of the murder of Laurent Jamy. For myself and Parker, I'd rather he never showed his face. Only a day and a night out of Hanover House and all I can see are red and purple flashes. Mrs. Ross. I, th I think I have snow blindness. A poultice is what you need. Sit. Parker makes the poultice out of tea leaves wrapped in calico and cooled in snow and makes me press it to my eyes. How far are we? We'll be there soon. I still don't understand. Why lead Stuart to the fires? That's exactly what he wants. I think he already knows where they are. I think he came this way before, with Nipapanese. But then he wouldn't need to follow you. He wants to find out if I know. Jamais blurted out where the furs are. Stuart, I think, went to see for himself. Once he found them, he wanted no one else to know. No one. Oh, why didn't he just take the furs? Maybe he's waiting till Jamais and Nipapanese deaths have blown over. I'm afraid. You can distinguish Stuart's trail from Mrs. Ross and Parker's. Easily. That's Mrs. Ross's moccasin. Stuart and Halfman are travelling faster. Better keep as close as possible. You're quite the tracker, Alec. My father taught me. He'd never have stepped on ice that was too thin. 
In front of us, I can just see, my eyes still hurting, a frozen lake kinked round a hulk of rock. Parker guides the dogs over its surface as white as a curling rink. And I think, we have nothing in common, he and I. When whatever happens, happens. There will be nothing to tie us. And I can't bear to think about that. The Durlet cabin is so weathered you can't see it until you're right up against it. In the corner lies an unopened pack. Parker slices its binding with his knife. Ever seen one of these before? Silver fox. In my hands it's supple, cold, as soft and smooth as silk. But I feel disappointed in Parker. Has he come all this way for the same thing as Stuart? I have to be alone with my thoughts. I leave the cabin and walk outside into the dazzling light that sends stabbing pains deep into my skull. I'm scared that my sight will never recover. At least it would mean that the last face I ever saw was Parker's. But then I stumble, fall to my hands and knees. There's a mound of churned snow. Parker! Are you all right? There's something here. What? In the ground. Move back. Let me see. <sighs> A wave of nausea fills me. It's him, isn't it? Ni papa knees. What happened to him? Shot. Oh. In the back. You keeping a report? <laughs> it's a letter, Alec, from a friend of mine. She writes so beautifully. Who is she? Her name's Maria. She's actually your mother's cousin. She never mentioned a cousin. Elizabeth will explain one day. We'd better get on. Put the poultice back on. Take this. A gun? Oh, my hands, they're so cold, I'm not sure I'll be able to use it. Maybe it won't be necessary. Give me your hands. They're not too bad. He takes my hands and guides them inside his shirt, trapping them in the warm flesh where his arms meet his body. We are locked like that, an arm's length apart. I put my head on his chest. His heart is beating as fast as mine. We don't speak. If I could be granted one wish, it would be that this night would never end. I'm selfish and probably wicked. Not thinking about me Papa Nese or Jamie or my son. And somewhere out there, Stuart is coming. Wake up. <gasps> Take my knife. Oh, they're here. There's no wind, no bird song, no sound of man or beast. It's dawn. They know we're in here. Then there's the softest sound of footsteps and snow coming near. getting closer. Imprints are fresher. This aunt of mine, will you marry her? <laughs> you are growing up. I'm almost as old as you. <laughs> I'd like to. I think about it. Maria and me, married, sitting together, children maybe maybe we'd go to the city or maybe we'd Mr. Moody up ahead who's that half man looked like an animal Shh. they're down there behind the rise come on
What happened with me, Papanese? He wanted the first for himself. He was going to kill me. You shot him from behind. I'm going to have to insist that you come out. Parker's grip tightens on his rifle. My eyes still burn, but I can see a little. Sit tight. I'm going out. Or else he'll open fire on both of us. He's still close to me, outside the window. William Parker, you are my love. You didn't have to kill Jamais. Who cares about Jamais? Only Papanese. A Frenchman and a half-breed. Like you. <gasps> oh, Parker. <laughs> when he kicks the door in, it slams into my forehead, toppling me, and I drop the knife. Come here! Come <laughs> By some miracle, the knife's fallen underneath me. I get it into my pocket as Stuart grabs me and jerks me to my feet. He pushes me in front of him, out of the door. (laughs) Brave man. Using a woman as a shield. He shouldn't have brought you. You brought me, Stuart. When you had Jamie killed, you have no idea how many people you've hurt. (laughs) Mr Moody. Who fired? I don't know. Hit the cabin from this side. Half man must be between them and us. Stuart's got Mrs. Ross. Parker? Disappeared behind the cabin. I'm going down. Stuart! Parker! Shut up! Parker! Half man, you there? Maybe he fell through the ice too! Murderer! Who's that? I don't recognize the voice either. But Stuart's disconcerted. Behind us, I think I see a figure. I hope it's Parker. I swing the knife out of my pocket and into Stuart's side, hard as I can. His eyes, bluer than the sky, catch mine. He has a smile on his brutal face as he swings his rifle toward me. Mrs. Ross, you okay? I throw my arms around Parker without thinking or caring. Close to, I can just see enough to make out Stuart, lying in his own blood. The face of a young boy looms beyond Parker's shoulders. I must be hallucinating. Then I recognise him. Alec, Elizabeth Bird's boy. Moody! He's back there! Half-man had shot at Parker while he was in the open parleying with Stuart. He missed. And Parker moved behind the cabin out of range. Over in the trees, Alec watched as Half-man turned and shot Donald. Parker fired back. Half-man was only wounded by Parker's bullet. He's limping north into nowhere. He won't last long. Alec took one shot at Stuart, who was raising his rifle at me, and killed his father's murderer. Donald! Oh! Oh! Oh. Mrs. Ross. Your son, Francis. Oh, shh! I'm sorry. Everything's fine. We'll look after you now. We wrapped Donald and Dinny Papanese in furs. Alec walks beside his father on the sled. Let the wolves take care of the murderer was his decision on Stuart's body. We found two letters on Donald. One from Maria Knox, the other, Donald's reply. Her tone and her words were gentle, longing. Donald writes to her about the life he imagines they'll have together. The two of them old, without regrets. I don't know if Parker's married. I never asked. He'll take me back to Himmelwanger, to Francis. I can prove my son's innocence now. I can only try to heal him of the loss of Jamie, his love. But Parker and I, after so much horror... We cannot go on. How are the eyes? Better. The 
prospect of leaving him is like the prospect of losing my eyesight. I think of all the things this man has been to me in so short a time. Stranger, fugitive, guide. Mrs. Ross, you never told me your name. <laughs> You've used it often enough. Lucy? <laughs> Lucy. He keeps walking. My true north, my lodestone, my love. And I keep walking too, for what else can any of us do?